Now let's come to order, folks. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> An hour of smiles in Town Hall tonight, folks. 60 minutes of fun and music brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of duty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Fun with our star comedian Fred Allen. Music with Peter Van Steeden. New songs, new laughs. It's Town Hall tonight. <laughs> The old town hall is bulging tonight, folks. Peter hasn't got room to swing his baton. He's going to try to direct the orchestra by sticking out his tongue. Can he do it? The overture is you never know. gentlemen, a message to all you folks who have broken mirrors during the last seven years. If you haven't had your bad luck, here he comes now, Fred Allen in person. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it is a pleasure to welcome you to our shabby but well-intended festivities. Now, first, we direct your attention to matters that have been masquerading as news during the past week. Peter, could you wake up the cornet player for just one tinny exhalation? Thank you. Now, don't let him go to sleep. We'll need another one in just a minute. The town hall news sees nothing. Shows ditto. Hollywood, California. Prominent moving picture comedian protests income tax assessment. Appearing before Federal Board of Tax Appeals, comedian claims that false teeth are tools of his trade and asks $3,500 reduction for special false teeth, which eliminated the hiss when the comedian used the letter S. Town Hall News interviews famous Hollywood personalities to get their opinions on present income tax laws. Zarel Danik, leading Hollywood producer, says... I'll sum it up in one word. Colossal. Were your studio's exemptions questioned, Mr. Danik? The attitude of the tax board was colossal. What to happen? Well, sir, in 1936, the studio claimed a $2 million loss by fire. Well, where was the fire? In our picture in old Chicago. Oh, I see. In 1937, the studio claimed a $2 million loss by water in our picture, Suez. A liquid liability. Yes. We had $2 million worth of water left over. The canal couldn't take it. Well, what? Weren't you allowed any exemptions? In one picture only, Mr. Moto gets a hot foot. <laughs> Mr. Moto gets a hot foot? Yes, Mr. Moto's shoes were ruined. And the tax board allowed you? Four dollars. It's colossal. Thank you. How is the picture business these days? It's colossal. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Darrell Dennis. A Hollywood glamour girl who is well pleased with her latest tax adjustment session, Miss Columbine Calhoun. Mind if little old Columbine talks profile, sugar. Columbine screens better profile. Uh, are you showing the north side of your face? Sir, Columbine Calhoun is from the Sioux. Oh, I see. Now, about your income tax. Well, I come up from Little Yam, Georgia, oh, to little... try out for Scarlett O'Hara. Little Yam, a Little Yam, Georgia. <laughs> well, uh, what exemptions did you claim, Miss Calhoun? $600 for crinoline, sunbonnet, and doodads. Uh-huh. $900 for makeup, 
False dimples, beauty spots, and eyelashes. $900 for eyelashes? I have big eyes, silly. Oh, I hadn't... I hadn't noticed your mouth's been open so much. Uh, were your claims allowed? Every last penny. Well, how do you account for that? My tax adjuster was from the suit. No southern gentleman talks money to a lady. Oh, if a gentleman mentions men. The lady assumes he's talking julep. Oh, I, a southern gentleman meets a lady halfway. Yes, indeedy. That's how I'm playing Scarlet. A charming southern gentleman's making the picture. A southern gentleman is producing Gone with the Wind? Sure enough. Colonel David O. Selznick. Colonel <laughs> David O. The O is for Oglethorpe. If Oglethorpe ain't soup, just hush my mouth. <laughs> An excellent idea. And thank you, Miss Columbine Calhoun. A Hollywood leading man who is furious at the tax appeal board, Mr. Delsart Trundle. Hollywood has seen the last of Delsart Trundle. Adieu to the silver screen. You had uh, income tax troubles, Mr. Trundle? Trouble? Every business expense of mine was thrown out. Riding crops, $200, thrown out. Mufflers, $700, thrown out. Beret tassels, $900, thrown out. <laughs> toupees, $8,000, thrown out. You spent $8,000 for toupees? Certainly, I have 87 toupees. There's my tousle toupee for waking up, my matted toupee for the swimming pool, and my toupee with the rhinestone part for evening wear. Oh, those rhinestone parts, they're all... <laughs> <laughs> and none of the none of those <laughs> that him who is without script uh, forget the first stone it's Ryan Stone and none of these were allowed in your income tax the tax board ruled the toupee was a luxury and you? I claim the toupee is overhead overhead <laughs> and thank you Mr. Adieu America Del Trundle bids you adieu and thank you very much have you seen Spawn of the North? no I I play a salmon in it with the <laughs> with the toupee? why are you insulting Grimaldi? adieu America and for America adieu tr de Del Trundle <laughs> Einstein <laughs> And now the town hall... I'll, uh, I'll go now. Yes, pick up your stone yeah. and leave. If you <laughs> and now... And now the town hall news brings you a scene from the Hollywood Board of Tax Appeals. The comedian who protested the ruling on false teeth is called to explain the scene, the tax appeal chambers. Tax appeal board is ready. First protest. I'm first, Mr. Referee. Name? Jed Box. You are the famous Hollywood comedian? The fans call me the number one sourpuss of the jumping Rembrandts. I see. Now, what is this claim, $3,500 exemption on your income tax? It's for false teeth. I got five sets of crockery at $700 a set. That's $3,500. Well, isn't one set of teeth enough? Not in the movies, Mr. Referee. I gotta have different teeth for different moods. You have all of these teeth here? I'm wearing one set, my eating teeth. And the other four sets I got right here on the table. I see. What is that first set, Exhibit 1? These are my lounging teeth. <laughs> I just wear them around the house. Can't you wear that same set making pictures? I can't talk in these teeth. They sis. <laughs> Look, I'll show you. I'll put them in. Uh, say something, Barks. See? Nothing I can say without sissing. <laughs> I see. And uh, the other exhibits? These are my laughing teeth. These are my sneering teeth. And these are my gnashing teeth. Your gnashing teeth? Yes, they're on castanet plates. Wait, uh, I'll put them in. Curse you, desperate Desmond. I won't sign them papers. Get the idea? Now, what's your ruling, Mr. Referee? The tax board will allow you the cost of only one set of teeth marks. You owe $2,800 more on your income tax. I haven't got the money, Ralph. Then until the extra tax is paid, the board is holding your hissing, laughing, sneering, and gnashing teeth. Then you better hold my eating teeth, too, Ralph. Uh, here. Hey, wait a minute. If I can't look, I can't eat. How long, Ralph? New York City, New York. 
500,000 gaily colored flowers are put on display at the American Museum of Nat Natural History <laughs> as Horticultural Society of New York opens its 31st annual flower show. Town Hall News gives a brief flash of last rose in bloom at the fall flower show. The rose in bloom. Hello, go boy. Rose in bloom. <laughs> New York City, New York. District Attorney Thomas E. Dewey, exhausted by strenuous official duties and recent campaign activities, enjoys first rest he has had for several months. Returning to his office at 3 p.m. the day following election, Mr. Dewey said, quote, That is the first good night's sleep I have had since last June, unquote. Town Hall News brings you a one-second flash of the District Attorney sleeping. Where were you on the night of June 12th? And now the Merry Max, their song, I've Got a Pocket Full of Dreams. I'm no millionaire, but I'm not the type to care, cause I've got a pocket full of dreams. It's my universe, even with an empty purse, cause I've got a pocket full of dreams. Take the wealth on Wall Street For a road where nature trod And I calculate I'm worth my weight In golden rods Lucky, lucky me I can live in luxury Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams I'm no millionaire But I'm not the type to care Because I've got a pocket full of dreams A pocket full of dreams my universe, even with an empty purse, because I've got a pocket full of dreams, a pocket full of dreams. Lucky, lucky me, I can live in luxury. Ladies and gentlemen, I discovered an inexpensive hobby that can very easily take the place of yachting, polo, and bingo. I began making a collection of signs and portents. You know, like when your hand itches, it's a sign you'll, you'll receive money. Harry, have you uh, any gems I could jot down in my notebook? Well, uh, oh, there's one that if a child has a lot of freckles, it's a sign he'll grow up to have a lot of friends. I never heard that one. Got any more? Well, how about... Uh... Oh, if you dream of vegetables, that's a sign of wealth and success. Say, you're being very helpful. Now, how about another one? Another one, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, if you have an unattractive smile, it's a sign you don't give your teeth and gums the proper attention. Well, that sounds vaguely familiar, but uh, go on. Well, and that, in turn, is a sign that you should switch to Ipana toothpaste and gum massage to help you have the kind of smile you can be really proud of. You see, ladies and gentlemen... Your teeth are seldom bright and sparkling when your gums are soft and tender. And since the creamy, well-cooked foods we eat do not give our gums the exercise and stimulation they need for that health, we must help supply it some other way. The iPana way is an ideal way. That is why, like so many dentists, we earnestly suggest this. Brush your teeth with iPana toothpaste regularly. And when you do, put a little extra iPana on your brush or fingertip and massage it on your gums. Because Ipana, with massage, was especially designed to help tone and stimulate undernourished gums at the same time it cleans and brightens your teeth. Now, don't let neglect mark you down for serious gum trouble, ladies and gentlemen. Get an economical tube of Ipana at any drugstore tomorrow. And help yourself to healthier gums, brighter teeth, and a winning smile by faithfully using Ipana toothpaste. <laughs>
Don't tell you bow too far over, Peter. That shirt front will come out. <laughs> Peter Van Steeden and his symphony cast-offs, the Ipana Troubadours, have just finished Palestina. Gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet... Uh, who, Harry? Well, uh, One guess. One guess? Uh-huh. A card detective. Right, Harry. Uh -huh. We are going to interview... <laughs> Your glory is short-lived, you know. You still have that Reinstein against you from earlier in the... Uh, Harry, we're going to interview the only card detective in America today. His life is devoted to catching and exposing crooks who specialize in card games. He has recovered many thousands of dollars for gullible bridge and poker players who have unsuspectingly gambled with strangers. And so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet the world's famous card detective... Mr. Michael McDougall. Good evening, Mr. McDougall. Everybody calls me Mickey, Mr. Allen. Would you rather I called you uh, Mr. Mickey? Mickey? <laughs> no, uh, just Mickey. I'm more used to it. All right, and you can leave the trailer off my name, too. I won't go into what I'm used to being called, Mickey. <laughs> now, Uncle Jim tells me that you are the only detective specializing in crooked card players in the country. Is that true? Well, as far as I know, Fred, yes. It sounds like mighty interesting work. Big game hunting indoors. But tell me, what, um, what qualifications are essential to a card detective? Well, it's his job to know all of the tricks employed by card shops. Is this no Trump skullduggery, a big business? I should say so. Millions of dollars change hands every day in crooked card games and other gambling pastimes. Yes, even people tuning in on a radio program are taking a gamble. Since pasteboard conniving has assumed these proportions, I am surprised that more men aren't taking up your work. Well, Fred, to get results in my profession, you have to be able to do all of the card shops tricks, and then some. And you can duplicate all of their nefarious mumbo-jumbo? <laughs> yes, after years of application, I find myself qualified to manipulate the manifestations of fortune with malignant dexterity. Say, I haven't heard a vocabulary get a workout like that since the day I stepped on a Harvard professor's bunion, Mickey. <laughs> but tell me, what are some of the card shop's tricks you have mastered? Well, for one thing, I can deal myself a grand slam in bridge or four aces in poker at any time. Without being detected? Why, you'd swear my deal was on the level. Where did you acquire this skill at card manipulation? I uh, used to be a magician in vaudeville, Fred. A magician? You didn't finally make vaudeville disappear, did you, Mickey? <laughs> no, not me. Well, somebody did. How did you... Uh, how did you uh, get from vaudeville into card sleuthing? Well, at first, people started to consult me about card cheats that they suspected. They'd ask you to kibitz at their games? No, they'd invite me to play to see if I could detect any card manipulation. And now you devote all of your time to it? Most of it. When I started, most of the work was for individuals. Later, I was consulted by various clubs, conventions, and steamship agencies. Well, tell me, Mickey, how does a Hoyle hooligan work on the high seas? <laughs> well, let's say that you're taking an ocean trip, Fred, uh -huh. and the boys select you as their victim. Ah, uh -uh, that is their first mistake right there. <laughs> the extent of my gambling is AT&T roulette. <laughs> That's a new game on me, Fred. Now, AT&T Roulette is dropping a nickel into a phone slot, spinning the little dial wheel, and waiting to see what number you get. <laughs> it's a gamble. I see. Well, if you did enjoy a game of cards that get you into a game and let you win steadily, they'd wine you and they'd dine you on the trip until you became great friends. And then? The very last day, you'd be trapped in several big poker pots, rubbers of bridge, or perhaps a round of red dog, and be cleaned out. Well, isn't it obvious to the player that he's being, shall we say, uh, hugger-muggered? <laughs> very seldom. I know a movie executive who lost $4,000 on one hand. When he was told he'd been cheated, he wouldn't believe it. It could only happen to a movie executive. <laughs> Is $4,000 considered a big uh, score? Not in those games. Recently, I recovered a check for $51,000 for a young millionaire. And I've known of a quarter of a million dollars changing hands in one crooked poker game. Well, it's hard to believe that a person with his eyes open can't detect a card shop. Well, you know the old saying, Fred. The hand is quicker than the IRT. <laughs> That's right. For instance, last week I gave a demonstration at the Cavendish Club. In a regular game? Yes, I played against two famous players with Josephine Culbertson and the Four Aces and other bridge celebrities looking on. The idea being to test brilliant play versus the shopper's tricks. Exactly. If I were caught doing anything suspicious, I was to lose the game. What happened? 
Well, if we'd been playing for money, I'd have finished owning the club. <laughs> Every time I dealt, I made a grand slam. How? Simple. I just dealt myself all the aces and kings. You can pick out aces and kings without even seeing them? That's right. I can recognize high cards by the feel. Well, that beats me. Well, it would in a poker game. <laughs> can all card shops do these things, Mickey, without being caught? Most of them can. Their fingers move so fast that even the slow-motion camera you can't know, detect them. I am sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt there. I saw a hyphen, and you know me, the smallest <laughs> opening, forgiven. and I'm right there. <laughs> Oh, an old cat. <laughs> it wasn't really a hyphen at that, Mickey. I just looked again. It's my astigmatism flattened out there. I mean. But I know an old gambler, Hot Ace Mullen. Things broke badly for him down in Florida, and he got a job as a chef. But Hot Ace, Hot Ace Mullen was a crooked heart. He used to serve a club sandwich and palm the bacon. <laughs> He was very fast. Well, uh, most card players are lightning calculators. They can riffle a deck, memorize the position of the high cards, and then deal them in their own hands. They must be an abnormal set of people, Mickey. Why, they even have their own language. What is it like? Well, suppose I tell you a little story in card sharp slang. See if you can make anything out of it. All right, go ahead, Mickey. Well, let me see. A uh, brace of broad tossers that had been hustling the Duke played bloomer after bloomer. When they were down to a Michigan BR and some please don't rain on me keisters, they threw in with a paper man, pulled their scratch, and went in for deep sea fishing. Just as soon as the sardines kissed the whale goodbye, they took a gander at the tip and picked an umpshay. He went for the pasteboards. They gave him the business for three G's. Everything was copacetic because the bees art was no hip gee. Wow. <laughs> what does that mean, Mickey? Uh, translated, it means that a sucker was gypped. Uh, well, where do you where do you do most of your work these days? Well, bridge clubs and conventions. Then I do quite a bit of private investigating. Have you ever been called in on a political job? Political? Well, you know, as a card detective, I thought perhaps some diehard Republican might have called you in to take a look at the New Deal. <laughs> no. The uh, only card interest that I have in Washington, Fred, is my Social Security card. <laughs> you didn't borrow that fellow's teeth who was on here. <laughs> but before we, before, we, before we put the conversational deck away, is there any advice you can give to our audience? Well, there are three good rules to follow to prevent being cheated, Fred. One... Don't gamble with strangers. Two. Don't gamble for high stakes. Three. Don't gamble. That is... That's excellent advice, Mickey. I resolve here and now never to make another bet. Oh, that's what they all say. I Fred. know, but not me. Well, I hope not, but something tells me you'll be betting again before you know it. Yeah, I'll bet you two bucks I never bet again. <laughs> that's all I wanted to know. Good night, Fred. And good night, Mickey McDougal. <laughs> And now the town hall singers, ladies and gentlemen, under the direction of Lynn Murray, sing for you, Oh, Miss Hannah. Oh, Miss Hannah, ain't you coming out tonight? The mockingbird and singing, and the moon and shining bright. The roses and the nodding, and a swaying in the breeze. Get on your Sunday go to meeting clothes, and come along, come along, please. Can't you hear the strumming? Can't you hear the call? Oh, can't you hear the folks a-dancing at the old up fellas hall? For strolling down the levee by the light of the moon, a listening to the fiddle and the mocking birds too. No, oh, Miss Hannah.
And now with the recent hot news from Hodge White that his consignment of red flannels has finally arrived and is on sale at the local emporium, we may safely assume that winter has arrived. So Town Hall interviews two members of the elite, upper brackets to Hodge, regarding their winter wardrobes. Mrs. Anastasia Field, the seven. Well, I've purchased a very simple but stunning suit for skiing. By the way, it's pronounced sheing. Oh, thanks a lot. And then a skating outfit in Dubonnet and gold. And my little dressmaker has whipped up a nubby wool confection for ice boating that's... Well... I, uh, I can imagine. And uh, you, Mr. Field, how's uh, your wardrobe coming along? I'm all set. One muffler, one woolen dressing gown, one open fireplace, and a long book. Don't you indulge in any winter sport? Yes, sneezing. At the first sign of winter, I... 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 Achoo, start sneezing. Well, then I'm sure, sir, that you will take a very personal interest in what Harry has to say. And ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that everyone else who feels a cold coming on will do the same. Get after that cold immediately. Fight it two ways at once with Sal Hepatica. So many physicians will tell you the same thing, ladies and gentlemen. For with sparkling Sal Hepatica, you clear away any accumulated wastes quickly, yet gently. And in addition, you also help nature counteract acidity, which so often accompanies a cold. So do the wise thing. Get a bottle of Sal Hepatica at any drugstore and use it at the first sign of a cold. Show your family the way to better health with this famous mineral salt laxative. Sal Hepatica. Town Hall tonight continues immediately after a short pause for your station identification. Van Steeden and his Ipana Troubadours have just played a digest version of Why'd You Make Me Fall in Love. Now, on Friday night, the Isaac Walton Club, Lodge Number 7, will meet here at the town hall. Professor Bascom Karp, the eminent authority on fish, will give a short talk called Why the Mickey Only Has One Fin. <laughs> now, on Sunday afternoon... I'm here, Mr. Allen. Oh, hello, Portland. <laughs> I, uh, well, I did a little hog calling as I was addressing you. A ham might show up. You never can tell. Well, into each life some rain must fall. And you, Portland, are a shower freelancing. Oh, is that nice? Now I forget what I was going to say. Oh, just say anything. Anything you say accidentally will be better than something you were going to say on purpose. Oh, I know what it was. I just came from the automobile show. Oh, did you go down to look for samples again? No, but when it's too cold to hitchhike outdoors... You? Yes, I go to the auto show to keep my thumb in practice. Oh, stationary hitchhiking. Well, that doesn't help you greatly, does it? Well, I meet a lot of people who are buying new cars. And do uh, you show them your thumb so they'll recognize it on the road later? <laughs> no, but I do see the models that won't stop for me next year. Say, I haven't had a chance to go down. Have the new cars many improvements? Oh, yes. One car has bifocal windshields. Bifocal windshields? Yes, in case the driver forgets his glasses. Oh, he puts his nose up in through the windshield and he's all set. Well, that's fine. And there's another car with an extra shock absorber. An extra? Yes. You don't feel the shock on the down payment. Oh, that's taken care of in the car. There's a man in there hits you over the head, I suppose. As you Say, I hear there's one new model that has a radio speedometer this year. If you're doing 20 miles an hour, the radio tunes itself into uh, Wayne King. If you do 40, you get the hit parade. And the minute you go 60 miles or over, the radio tunes in on Orson Welles. <laughs> Somebody paging me? Oh, oh hello, Peter. <laughs> Don't turn around or we'll have the same trouble in here. <laughs> now for a good... <laughs> now for a good, bleak, dull few minutes. 
Oh, yeah? <laughs> you were cut, too, huh? I can always get a laugh out of Peter, Mr. Allen. Well, I can, too, looking at him. But the minute he opens his mouth, he starts to let down. <laughs> Only one thing happens when you open your mouth. You air condition your neck. <laughs> That's what I you, Mr. Oh, Allen. wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll prove who's the comedian on this program. There's long been a doubt. I know the talk that's going around. But I'm going to prove it tonight. I'll bet $5 I can get a bigger laugh than Van Steeden. I'm calling that bluff. And not mentioning any names, eh? <laughs> and the bet is on. You bet. I know I bet. What about you? <laughs> Here's my five dollars. Here's mine. Who'll hold the stakes? I will. Oh, no, you don't. If I win the money clowning, I'm not going to race for it, too. <laughs> I'll get Harry to hold it, fellas. Hi. Yes, Forty. Uh, will you hold this ten dollars? <laughs> what for? Well, Mr. Allen is betting Peter yeah. that he's funnier than he is. Then who is funnier than whom? <laughs> I'm betting my stooge here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Doesn't say stooge on my sheet here. Somebody's been tinkering with it. Says boss. How can boss get into stooge there? <laughs> Who's been fooling with the ink? I'm betting my stooge here I can get a bigger laugh than he can. Now, well, look at the head start you've got with that hair. <laughs> Honestly, your head looks like a pussy willow that just doesn't care. <laughs> and your head looks like the end of a wet totem pole. You talked on a laugh again. Oh, my God. Thirty-two minutes it's taken to get a laugh, and you step on it. You've got to come into the studio barefooted after this, Peter. Then when you step on a point, you'll know it. All right, now let's have that again, that wow, where you give it to me. Your head looks like a pussy will etc., 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 care. Your head looks like the end of a wet totem pole. Let him just stay there and have a little uh, quiet by himself. All right, uh, who, who gets the $10? Who wins? Oh, they haven't started yet, Harry. No, no, nothing's been going on. No, I was just warming up. Now for some comedy. All right, now we're... we're now, wait a minute. The one who gets the biggest laugh wins the $10. That's right. All right, who's first? I'll go first. Two little sardines in a skillet. What song are they singing? Two little sardines in a skillet? What song are they singing? What song are they singing? Small Fry. <laughs> well, all right. That got one laugh. Yeah, well, uh, Pete, you're the, uh, you're the one that laughed. Well, I was nearer to the gang. I got it full blast. Oh. <laughs> Where's that boy? Have you seen that boy? What boy? There's a boy paging me. They said he came in here. No, no. There are two places the boy hasn't been. Here and Cantor's house. <laughs> well, they say he's calling me. He's always calling me. Who are you? Philip Morris. <laughs> Philip Morris. He and the Wild have been called for years. Neither of them answer. <laughs> Quit stalling, Alan. Come on, get funny. I can use that ten bucks. All right, all right. Small fry was your entry. Now, uh... <laughs> pull, pull up a script here and learn something. I'm going to tell a joke. All right, Harry, just relax. Two missionaries met in the jungle one morning. <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> That's, that isn't the finish yet. Although... I may regret later that I stopped you, but for now, I'm going ahead and see what happens here. Two missionaries met in the jungle one morning. The first missionary said, Hast thou seen the cannibal chief, brother? The second missionary said, Yea, brother, I have seen the cannibal chief. He has indigestion. And the first missionary said, Is it anybody we know? Come on. I should have let you go on, Harry. Quit stalling, Alan. What's the finish? I didn't get it either. 
Look, uh, please, who wins? Well, here? you're the huh? judge. You're oh, the no, judge. No, Harry. no, not in this contest. Uh, take your money back, fellas. You're not getting me mixed up in this. Well, I got one laugh. It's a moral victory for me. Moral victory? For five dollars, you don't know what a moral is. It's a painting they put up to save wallpaper. A painting they put up to save wallpaper. <laughs> Give me those ten clams, Harry. Yeah, you lose, Pete, on that one. Oh, yes. A moral is an Aesop P.S., Peter. Well, it was a slip of the tongue. I've been eating too much butter lately, and my tongue slips. <laughs> you... <laughs> you ought to try eating spinach and sand it down. <laughs> Come in. Okay, folks. Okay, Sergey. Okay. Okay. Well, of all the nerve, what... Uh, who was that, Mr. Ballard? Well, who knows? What do they think this is, a music mortuary? <laughs> Musicians coming in here and leaving dead notes? <laughs> Watch those cracks, Alan. My mother was a musician. That's more than your son can say for you. <laughs> Play it, folks. Okay, Sergei. Okay. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> and you too. <laughs> Hold that gastric obligato. This is no backyard here. This is a radio studio. To whom are you talking to? Could be me. Yes, I'm talking to you. Quiet, please. It was quiet until you and this Balkan bazooka blower got in here. <laughs> Sergey is preparing trombone solo. Standing back kindly. Who are you? I'll tell you who he is. And when you finish, tell me who you are, will you? <laughs> you are looking on Sergey Hotlips Pipic. <laughs> I am Russia's answer to Toscanini. Yeah, and I am Sergey's agent. Bad news travels fast enough. Broccoli chin here doesn't need an agent. <laughs> Sergey's lips are cooling. I am blowing a hot liquor. Wait, wait. <laughs> Quiet, quiet, and put that moan trap down now before I hold a one-man plebiscite. Now, what does this corn peddler want in here? Sergey is over from Russia to revolutionize swing music. I am stopping the jitterbug movement in parasites. Well, you'll stop music just tuning up. Every musician today is turning classical music into swing. No. Right. Sergey is turning swing music into classic. Well, he can't play swing music in classic tempo. Tempo is in Florida. Who needs it? <laughs> Sergey plays Boylan like Beethoven. Gordon and Revel, I am playing like Chopin. That's Waller, I am playing like Verdi. Yeah, he's playing a concerto on the air tonight. Where? <laughs> right here. Okay, Sergey. Okay. I am playing flat-footed Fluji concerto in two flats. <laughs> The flat-footed Fluji Concerto? Is the title. Now it's coming Concerto. Okay. 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 Okay, there you are, Alan. You had some left over, didn't you? <laughs> Don't leave it laying around in here. Well, now Sergei Hotlip's peepick is finishing. Swing is through. And so are you. Okay, Portland. Okay, Peter. <laughs> And now, saluting the flower show, the Merrimack sing when you wore a tulip. <laughs> Yellow tulip 
And I wanna be beautiful rose When you cuddle up a little closer And caress me, heaven bless me With a blessing No, no, no one will ever know You made life cheery When you called me dearie And it was down where the bluegrass grows Your lips were sweeter than the sweetest sound of mint julep When you were wearing a bright yellow tulip Those of you who get around, as the quaint saying goes, have probably noticed that everything worthwhile is reserved nowadays. The best tables, the best theater seats, the best places anywhere. So not to be outdone, before we went on the air, we placed a big reserve sign over the next minute of our program, reserving it for a certain prominent gentleman and a very important subject. Your microphone, Harry. Thank you, Fred. Every day, ladies and gentlemen, more and more of you are finding Minute Rub the very thing you've been looking for to help bring quick, soothing relief to all sorts of muscular discomfort. Minute Rub, spelled M-I-N-I-T-R-U-B, was originally developed for the strained, overworked muscles of football players, wrestlers, and other hard-playing athletes. And it proved so effective for them that men and women everywhere began demanding it. As a result, Minute Rub is now available in drugstores from coast to coast. If you have sore, aching muscles of any kind, ladies and gentlemen, here's all you have to do. Just squeeze a little minute rub from the tube into the palm of your hand and rub it off. Almost immediately, minute rub's analgesic action starts to ease the pain of those aching muscles. And minute rub's counter-irritant action stimulates circulation to help bring you additional soothing, grateful comfort. So get an economical tube of greaseless, stainless minute rub at any drugstore tomorrow. And always keep it handy for the whole family. No matter what they've been using, see if they don't appreciate this new and better way to help bring quick, welcome relief to muscular discomfort. Minute Rub. by Peter Van Steeden and the boys. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Alan R. players. Tonight they bring you an artistic blunder, a well-rehearsed faux pas, the treats of big business. It's called The Bank's Dilemma, or The Teller Knew the Guilty Party, but the teller wouldn't tell. (laughs) Overture, Peter. Eureka National Bank, assets two millions, liabilities, I'm laughing, good morning. <laughs> oh, Mr. Allen will be here promptly at 8.59. What time is it? It's 8.59, Miss Bond. Right on time, F.A. Punctuality is the keynote to success, Miss Bond. You're wanted on the phone. Thank you. Hello? Eureka National Bank, F.A. speaking. You want 20,000 call money? Okay. No, no, the bank won't send it over. It's call money. You can call and get it. Goodbye. <laughs> now to start banking. Gad, this is a momentous day for Eureka National. Our anniversary. One hundred years of bank and we have never made a mistake. Eureka! Eureka National, Miss Bond. <laughs> and now for a busy day. What is first on my, uh, on my list there? Your morning vice president, Bill. Oh, yes. Buzz for my vice president. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, babe. On our toe, staff. Are we ready with our morning chant of the vice presidents? You You bet, F.A. Very well. And remember, let us start each banking day with pear-shaped tones. Go. The chant of the vice presidents. We're We're quiet quiet as mice. We We never set set precedents. And who are we, staff? We're We're the vice presidents. presidents. And what do we do? We We sit at our desks. We couldn't be meeker. We yes you all day for dear old Eureka. Very, very good. And now, 
for our gardenia drill. Are we ready? Yes, yes sir. Babe. Right hand to left lapel. One, two. Gardenia out. Out. Gardenia in. In. Gardenia out. Out. In. In. Out. In. Out. In. Out. In. In. Rest. Rest gardenia. In. Now for our... Now you overlap this there, CB. Now for our buzzer calisthenics. Uh, F.A. Yes, C.L.? May I be excused from buzzer calisthenics, F.A.? C.L.? Uh, my thumb is indisposed, F.A. A hangnail. A vice president with a hangnail? Uh, you know how important the finger is in the banking business, C.L. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Very well, very well, then. We shall skip buzzer calisthenics. Shall we do our pussyfoot exercises, F.A.? No, no, no stomping around, boys. This is Eureka National's anniversary. One hundred years of bank. And what is it we have never made? All together now, a what? A mistake. Exactly. And to celebrate our records, today the Eureka National is going to promote a vice president. Goody, goody. Stand out, F.D. Yes, sir. F.D., in recognition of your invaluable service as vice president in charge of, uh, what is it again? Ink outgoing. Ink outgoing. Oh, yes. <laughs> F.D., Eureka National, taking cognizance of the 20 years of sterling, spattered endeavor you have rendered at the inkwell, takes pleasure in rewarding this faithful service. I'm going to get a raise, F.A.? Yes, F.D. From now on, instead of F.D., you will be called F.D. Sharp. The bank is raising you half a tone. Willikers! Congratulations, F.D. F.D. what, staff? Oh, F.D. Shaw. Ah, that's better. And now, Vice President, about face. Hip. Forward, march. Carry on, F.D. Shaw. You bet, F.A. Eureka National has brought joy to one heart on our anniversary, Miss Bond. And now to business. Anyone waiting? A new account. Mail. Oh, show him in. F.A., I'll see you. Okay, good. Ah, good morning. What can we do for you? I want to open the checking account. You uh, have references, of course. What? I'm putting the money in. You need the references. <laughs> Eureka National is 100 years old today. This bank has never made a mistake. Oh, yeah? Who hired you? <laughs> Fortunately, I have no sense of humor. Oh. Your name? Wall about Figgins. One G or two? Two, please. No cream. <laughs> Occupation? I'm a retired bank robber. Figgins, Figgins. You're not the Figgins who robbed our bank here last month. Oh, now why you ain't here to brag, bud? That was quite a haul. A hundred grand. I know. I hope you didn't spend it foolishly, Figgins. We bankers know how it is with you young businessmen. Easy come, easy go. Yeah, well, not me. I got my hundred grand and I'm putting it right back in the bank I got it out of. <laughs> right in here. Loyalty is a commendable quality, Figgins. Yeah. You're the kind of depositor Eureka National wants. Here's your uh, autograph checkbook. Uh, thanks, bud. You'll be dropping in from time to time to take out. Sure, sure, I'll be sure, looking sure. for you, Figgins. Uh, you only work daytime, don't you? Yes. Gee, that's too bad. You won't be seeing me. Well, so long. Happy drawing out, Figgins. Miss Bond? Yes, sir? Has the Federal Reserve called up this morning? No, sir. It's your turn to call them. Oh. <laughs> They're getting more reserved each day, aren't they? Say, what was that? That gong, Miss Bond? It sounded like the burglar alarm. Open that door. It may be Figgins making a withdrawal. Now, here, 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 here. What is this disturbance? Gone? I got him, F.A. Go. You're, you're creasing my chinchilla. Ah, Wilkins again. Yeah. Our problem depositor. Bring him into my office, God. Okay, F.A. No, Get no. in there, you. Oh, now, now, see here. <laughs> Wilkins. You are more trouble than all of Eureka National's depositors put together. What are you up to now? Nothing. Just good, plain, old-fashioned, unadulterated nothing. I caught him red-handed, F.A. Doing what? He sidled up to a desk and was filling his fountain pen with our ink. <laughs> Wilkins. Well, I can explain, Mr. Allen. I ran short of ink unexpected. I was going to put it back honest. Eh, it ain't the first time he swiped our ink, F.A. Do you think this incessant filching of Eureka National's ink 
Is fair to the bank, Wilkins? Well, honest, Mr. Allen, I, I was going to put it back. The Eureka National doesn't go over to your house and fill its fountain pens with your ink, does it? <laughs> well, I'll never do it again, Mr. Allen. Last month, you were caught smuggling two of our quality blotters out of the bag. <laughs> but they were used blotters, Mr. Allen. That isn't the point. <laughs> Your intent is the issue. Last September, you took one of the bank's calendars. I brought that calendar back! After 30 days had been torn off. <laughs> After that calendar had depreciated 8% in value. Yes, you brought it back. Well, I don't... You I... never add up your deposit slips correctly, Wilkins. And what did you do a week ago? I repeat, Wilkins, what did you do a week ago? One of my checks bounced? No, no. Well, Eureka National doesn't mind an occasional bounding peccadillo. <laughs> I refer now to your unpardonable faux pas of Tuesday last, Wilkins. In making a deposit, Wilkins, you use the night depository during the daytime. <laughs> but not to make a deposit. Wilkins. I thought it was a mailbox. I posted a letter. It was not a deposit. It was slipshod banking, Wilkins. <laughs> I'm afraid you haven't got the stuff in you that makes a Eureka National depositor. What are you going to do? A bank is as strong as its weakest depositor, Wilkins, <laughs> and you seem to be ours. I herewith give you notice as a depositor. No, no, not that. Give me one more chance, Mr. Allen. I'm sorry, sorry, Wilkins. Perhaps if you take your checking account to some smaller bank and start in at the bottom, well, you may in time develop into the kind of a depositor Eureka National wants. Mr. Allen, please! What is Mr. Wilkins' balance, Miss Bond? It's one million five hundred and thirty thousand dollars and ten cents. Give him a check. For the full amount? No, deduct ten cents for that ink he pilfered. <laughs> goodbye, Wilkins. Not goodbye, Mr. Allen. It's only au revoir. I'll make good. I'll be back. Time will tell, Wilkins. <laughs> Go. Yes, sir. Gad, what a day. Turmoil, heartthrobs, hurly-burly. But that's the banking game, hey, Miss Bond? Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen. Yes, who is it? N.B., sir. Vice President in charge of keep a straight line at the window, please. <laughs> yes, N.B.? There's been a mistake. What? Yes. Come in, Mrs. Kell. What is this, a bank or a madhouse? Is everybody going nuts? Eureka National will take just so much from a depositor, Mrs. Kelp. Look at this statement, Dopey. Ah, oh, yes. You have a balance of $2,438. It's a mistake. Eureka National has never made a mistake. I never had $2,438 all at once in my life. I'm a poor housewife. Where would I... If Eureka National says $2,438 is your balance, that is your balance. <laughs> My balance is $24.38. I don't want $2,438. You refuse to see it our way, Mrs. Kelly. <laughs> that in a depositor is rank insubordination. Mr. Allen. Yes, Bellwether. <laughs> the bank. The bank, sir, is swamped with mistakes, I think. Eureka National? Yes. This bank? Yes, all the bank balances have shot up. What? Mulligan, the butcher, just found that his balance is $7,698. Mulligan, 76... Why, Mulligan is broke. It isn't only Mulligan, sir. Everybody's credit balances have shot up. This is greenback sabotage. Somebody is boring from within. Open that door. <laughs> quiet, quiet, please. Quiet, everybody. Now, here, here. Let me look at some of these bank statements. Here's mine. Mine, too. Here's mine. Uh, why, the... Why, the decimal points are missing from all of these. Bellwether? Yes, I think. Who is vice president in charge of decimal points? Uh, uh, me, Miss Sir, in cubbyhole six. There's dirty... I'll check on Bemis right away. Don't move now. Don't move, you depositors. I'll be right back. Bemis? Bemis? Where are you, Bemis? Right here, I think. Come out from under your adding machine, Bemis. What is going on here in Cubby Hole 6? Well, sir, I couldn't... You uh, are sir. vice president in charge of decimals, Bemis. Yes, sir. Every decimal in this month's statement is missing. Well, I know, sir, I just couldn't... What uh, is eating you, Bemis? Or vice versa? Oh, I just don't know. 
I'm not the Bemis of old, sir. Look at you. Your gardenia dangling. Yeah. Your alpaca jacket akimbo. Oh. Your hair part off center. Oh. And one of your shoes tan. <laughs> one of your shoes tan and the other a moccasin. Yeah. Bemis, you are a sartorial jackpot. Uh, <laughs> Hello, sir. What is wrong? Well, sir, I'm, I'm in love. Love and banking don't mix, Bemis. I know. That's why my decimals are missing. You are too weak to hit your dot key, too unstrung to make a few dots. That's it. Dots, dots, dots. My girl's name is Dorothy. But what is that? I couldn't hit the dot key. It would have been like punching Dorothy, the woman I love. Bemis, this conduct is a spot on your banking escutcheon. Yes, sir, but all the world loves a lover, I think. All the world, I... But Eureka National has its own attitude, Bemis. Oh, be lenient, sir. I'm getting married tomorrow. Marriage is a mistake, Bemis. A Eureka National employee never makes a mistake. You mean... Yes, Bemis. You're fired. Oh. <laughs> give you next week's show in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. Harry and I would like, uh, would each like to post a brief but very important notice on the town hall bulletin board. The first one reads, the sponsors of this program earnestly hope that you and all the members of your family will accord the Red Cross full and unqualified support during its annual roll call, November 11th to the 24th. And Harry says, if you enjoyed tonight's program, ladies and gentlemen, you have yourselves to thank. Because it was brought to you in sincere appreciation of your friendliness and your loyalty to our famous products. I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. I pan a and Sal Hepatica. Thank you, Harry. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, next Wednesday evening, Town Hall tonight brings you the latest election returns. Manila, 1898. Dewey sunk. New York, 1938. Dewey repeats. <laughs> Songs from your flop parade. She was only a bird in a gilded cage. She's a little flat, isn't she? She's molting. Oh. <laughs> People you didn't expect to meet. A pretzel bender. Tune in next week and hear how one man makes crooked dough. And music. <laughs> Included on the program tonight was a title song from You Never Know, and I Used to Be Colorblind from Carefree. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thank <laughs> you.